John chapter 6. We're going to finish up the chapter. It's a long chapter, 71 verses. I'm going to read verses 41 through 71. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the world, life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, pray that these words, uh, they are many and in places complex and difficult to understand, but I pray that they would work in our hearts to produce the fruit of righteousness within us, that we might believe on your name. We pray in Christ's name. Have you ever been tempted to leave? And I mean, not leave the building or whatever, but I mean, just walk away from Christianity. And there's different reasons that somebody might want to leave. The Christian life is <clears throat> difficult. It's hard to live the Christian life. Uh, perhaps you have trouble believing all the doctrines. Uh, there's so many questions that you have that no one seems to answer to your satisfaction. Maybe you have trouble with Jesus, the mystery of the incarnation, the God-man. What does that mean? The Trinity, three persons, one essence. Things we can't wrap our heads around. Wouldn't it just be easier to believe in something you can see? Something concrete? Something that makes sense? In the end of that, you might wonder, uh, particularly as we, as we look at this passage this morning, does, does Jesus even want followers? Does he even want me as a follower? 
Why does he keep pushing people away? You know, we read a passage like this, and, and it's almost easy to start feeling better than Jesus. Right? Because we want everyone to join us. We want everybody, you know, if we're, if we're not wanting to leave Christianity, we want everybody to be a Christian, right? We want everybody to believe. We want to reduce all the barriers between us and other people. We want to make the path to belief as easy as possible. You know, we've spent time thinking about what it means to be a welcoming church. And, you know, what kind of, you know, even down to what kind of signage to have and how we present ourselves to the neighborhood. We want, you know, we want to be uh, open and friendly and have people come. More broadly, within the church in general, you know, we, we try to make our doctrines as presentable as possible, try to put them in language that, that everyone can understand. On the, the bad side of this, sometimes uh, we go so far as to compromise our doctrines and our beliefs to make it easier for people to come along. Now, that's not the right way to do it, but it shows just how much we want people to believe in Jesus. And yet in a passage like this, it just seems like Jesus is bent on offending people. It just seems like he's trying to push people away. He's, trying to, he's whittling the crowd down. Remember, he, he fed 15,000 people the day before what he's saying here. And he's going to, by the end of this passage, by verse 71, he's got 12 people, not 12,000. 12 people, and one of them is even going to prove to be of the devil. He wants to whittle the crowd down to a handful, though. He doesn't really want to be accessible in the way that we think of. He doesn't want to be easy to believe in. He only wants those who are uh, his to come to him. And he will freely and openly offend all others so that no one can pretend to follow him. No one can hide. Jesus presents himself here just as he is in no uncertain terms so that any sane person who doesn't truly put their faith in him will just walk away. No pretending, no masks, no phonies, only believers. Jesus makes it hard not to believe, but to believe superficially. He wants you to believe in him for who he is. Everyone else needs to go away and stop pretending like someone you're not. So we feel this tension in this passage. And there's a tension we feel perhaps even more so than the Jews who encountered him here. Because here, Jesus, at the beginning of this passage, he, he's just told them that he's the bread that came down from heaven. And their major objection at this point isn't that, uh, or is that this can't be, because we know who his parents are. He couldn't have come down from heaven, they say, because he came from Mary and Joseph. He came from Bethlehem. He came from Nazareth. How can someone who came from Mary or Joseph also be from heaven? They might think, sure, he's a nice boy. We grew up with him, we know him, we grew up next door, we know his parents. You know, but he's the son of Joseph, not the son of God. And this highlights the tension that we can feel as believers. How can something divine be so closely associated with something so undivine, so earthly? Ancient people felt this tension. But I think they might have even felt it a little bit less than we do. And we've been talking in Sunday school about how the ancient world was uh, thought very differently than we do. It was sort of uh, was still very close to the supernatural world. They understood uh, that there was a hidden realm that existed just beyond, just behind their physical realm. They believed in spirits. They believed in ghosts. I mentioned uh, Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer, who believed that there were elves who lived in the woods. You know, when lightning struck the tower, while he was out walking in a thunderstorm, he yelled out, Saint Anne, I will become a monk, because that lightning wasn't just a natural phenomena of uh, static electricity and clouds and things. It was a sign from God. It was something 
It was a direct message to him. But the world we live in is more and more closed off to the possibility that there's a realm of the divine at all, that there's anything supernatural to be believed in. Lightning is just lightning. And there are no elves in the woods. The world we live in is increasingly boxed in. There's a lead ceiling above us with such that there, if there is anything supernatural, we can't really know what it is. And the fact that the world is becoming less and less friendly to the idea of the supernatural makes it hard for Christians to believe in the supernatural because there's less and less of it around. There's less, you see less and less of it in the culture. It makes it hard for us to believe. There's immense pressure to get in, just to walk away, to say, yeah, this probably is all there is. And if this is all there is, then... My life is way too complicated with all this religion stuff. So why bother? So if the Jews had a hard time believing the son of Mary and Joseph was also the son of God, how much harder time do we have? Imagine if somebody in this church had a baby and the baby grows up and starts walking on water and healing people and then calling themselves God. It would be an absurdity. We would think that's ridiculous. That can't be true. Even forget religion, forget you know, the church or anything. Just, just imagine that that's what the scenario is. For the Jews, it was hard. And for us, and I, and I mean us as a culture, not just us in this church, it'd be impossible to believe that. But for Jesus, he's intent to answer their grumblings. Their grumblings, which, by the way, the, it's the word for murmuring. It's the same word that's used in the Old Testament when the Israelites are murmuring against Moses in the desert because they don't have food to eat. Jesus is content to just tell them that, you know what, not everybody's going to believe. Only those that the Father gives me will believe. No explanation beyond that. Now, just because you find it hard to believe doesn't mean that Jesus is trying to run you off. In fact, that's actually a good indication that, uh, that you're concerned about it, which is a good indication that you do believe. And wow, the benefits to those that do believe. Because he does follow it up right away by saying that whoever believes has eternal life. In verse 47. In other words, who, th th those that believe in him, who believe that he is the bread from heaven, don't merely have a good life that comes from eating earthly bread. See, a lot of what they were looking for was uh, a good life. They were looking for uh, glory on this earth. But Jesus is telling them, you have so much better than that when you come to me. You have eternal life when you eat divine bread. And you, if you eat this divine bread, you will not die. You can see the way that Jesus makes this connection between himself and bread and belief. In each sentence from verses 47 down through 51, he goes back and forth between himself and bread to tie them together, to sort of bring them closer to each other and finally come to a conclusion that they will never be able to accept. He says, belief gives life. I'm the bread of life. Physical bread doesn't give eternal life. Heavenly bread is living bread. I am the living bread. If you eat the living bread, you will live forever. And then he puts a bow on it. To eat the bread, you have to eat my flesh. My flesh is the bread of life. This is, to say this is controversial is an understatement be controversial in any context. The Jews break into an argument. How can, he, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? If Jesus was intent on losing fake followers, this was certainly the way to do it. Tell a Jew to eat the flesh of a man. Remember all the dietary laws that they had to follow. Clean animals, unclean animals. There were things they weren't even supposed to touch, much less eat. 
And here is a man telling us that we have to eat his flesh. But of course, Jesus pushes it even further and says uh, to them, truly, truly, that is to say, I solemnly swear that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Blood, of course, had a prominent and special place in their religion. Huge parts of their worship manual, the book of Leviticus, had to do with what to do with blood. Blood was sacred. It was special. It was the life of a person. It was the life of an animal. Animal blood was never to be eaten. It was always to be drained out or splashed against the altar. It was always given back to God. And Jesus is telling them to drink his blood. Now again, for us in the modern world, this might even be more offensive in a way than it was for the Jews. You know, the first century was at least a lot less sanitized than our world is. They lived in a world where animal sacrifice was a daily occurrence. They saw lots of blood all the time. There were always animals roaming around, kicking up dust, doing what animals do in the street. Life was messy for them. For us in our modern sanitized environments where unless you're a hunter, and I know there are some among us, most of our food is killed in slaughterhouses that we wouldn't even know how to get to if we tried, butchered behind closed doors. We don't have sheep and chickens wandering around the sanctuary like they might have done. The thought of eating somebody's body and blood is merely disgusting. It's abhorrent. We'd have moral issues, of course, as well. Shouldn't eat people. But our offense, I think, would be primarily and initially revulsion at such a thought. How disgusting would that be? But the, where our offense would be primarily revulsion, the Jews' issue would be primarily religious because it would cut to the heart of their religion. We know that God would never want us to eat the flesh or drink the blood of another human being. And yet here is one claiming to be God who is telling us to do just that. That's too far. We can't go there. This is wrong. And we have to take a second and wonder just what is Jesus saying here? You know, someone is someone to take us straight to the Lord's Supper with a passage like this in, in trying to understand what Jesus is talking about. Uh, you know, when we take the sacrament, we uh, say that we are eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? We understand this in spiritual terms, not that the bread and wine become physical body and blood. But we still understand that by receiving those things, we are receiving Christ himself in, in some sort of a mystery. Because Jesus did say, this is my body and this is my blood. So I do, but I do think there is a, I do think there is a connection there between what Christ is saying about uh, his body and blood and communion. But I don't know that Jesus is explicitly making that connection to his hearers. He hasn't yet instituted the Lord's Supper. So I don't think he's telling them about a ritual that most of them will never participate in. I think he's instead telling them about a ritual that they participated in for centuries. I think he means for them to think in terms of Old Testament sacrifices. And again, I think we're seeing that tension between heaven and earth, between associating the divine with the earthly. You know, as a Jew in uh, the Old Testament, and of course this is still Old Testament times, by the way, Christ has not died on the cross yet. But as a Jew in that day, uh, it would be easy for you to participate in the sacrifices, in the sin offering, the guilt offering, the peace offerings, and so on, and think that that was the end of it. It's always easy to make religion just a meaningless ritual, right? It's always easy just to sort of go through the motions and do the stuff and think that you're fine. They perform the ritual, their sin was forgiven. But, you know, we spent a number of weeks uh, a while ago working through Leviticus, and so you know that those sacrifices were not an end in themselves. When they participated in the sacrifice, when they killed the lamb or slaughtered the bull, or when they ate the food that came uh, as a result of uh, a peace offering, for instance, they weren't doing a ritual that was self-contained. 
They were doing something spiritual with earthly things. When they ate, they ate something that brought the divine with it. Heaven and earth connected there in that temple or in that tabernacle with those sacrifices. They did those things in the presence of God, and what they did on earth accomplished something in heaven. All that bloodletting and all the animals that went up and smoke on the altar, every meal eaten in the temple court, when it was done by faith, applied the blood of the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. For hundreds of years, those who believed in the promises of God, these people of God, had already been eating the flesh of Christ. When they ate the bread or the meat of the offering, they were eating the bread of life. And Jesus here now tells them that the final bread is here. The last supper of the last sacrifice has arrived, and it is Christ himself. And now it remains to be seen if that can be believed. Because what Jesus is talking about here is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's a matter of belief. To believe is to eat and drink. Drinking blood is, of course, something they had no experience with. But just as the blood was spilled on the altar was a part of that animal, the blood that Christ would spill was a part of him. And when you get any part of Christ, you get the whole Christ. This isn't like the old covenant. He isn't divided up one part for food, one part for sacrifice, one part for the altar. But all of him was given for you on that cross. Jesus had a number of disciples at the time. As I said, there were disciples who were learning from him and following him. But this was a bridge too far. They couldn't comprehend what it meant to drink the blood of Christ and eat his flesh. Even though it was as simple as believing in him, they couldn't see that he was the culmination, the end, the point of all that had gone before. They couldn't accept that this earthly man was also divine. And for that very reason, he asked them, what would you do if, I, if you saw me ascend to where I came from? It's just too hard to believe that he's divine. Yet he is there speaking words of spirit, and lied to them, and so many of them turned away. Well, finally, Jesus, having run off nearly everyone who was around, turns to his 12 disciples, knowing, of course, that one of them is going to betray him because he was of the devil. But he looks at this group of, of, of men here, and he says, are you going to go away too? And Peter answers, not so much with a... Uh, a really resounding declaration of faith, but almost a, 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 a declaration of, um, of uh, hopelessness in anything else. It says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You're the Holy One of God. Have you ever been tempted to leave? Where would you go? You know that in that Leviticus passage we read, it talked about the peace offering and what to do with the meat that comes from it. You'll note that the meat had to be consumed by the third day. If there was anything left over, it had to be thrown away on that third day or burned with fire, or you would be exiled. You would not, that would be lost. You would not be accepted before the Lord. You would be eating defiled meat and could no longer be part of God's people. Jesus Christ comes to you offering to feed you with himself, with his resurrected body. Now, Jesus rose on the third day. So it might seem that Jesus is offering you defiled, three-day-old flesh. But he's not. It's not the defiled, wormy flesh of the old creation, but the glorified, resurrected, perfected flesh of the new creation. It's new flesh because a new man has risen from the grave. And he promises that you too will share in that resurrection if you believe in him, if you feed on him by faith. Where else can you go for that? 
Talk to anyone who says they don't believe in God, and you'll soon find out what God they believe in. Science or astronomy or their job or their kids, everybody worships something. If you walk away, if you leave, you'll still worship. You'll still have a God. You can't help but be religious. That's built into you. You'll trust something. And if you trust in anything but Christ, you'll fall far short of anything real or meaningful or even good or happy. The God of Islam is terrifying and graceless. Buddhism, if you're lucky, after thousands of years, you might evaporate into a void. That's the high point. Science is quite popular, but when practiced right, every dogmatic claim it makes is and should always really be followed by a question mark. And it's as good as at dramatically shortening life as it is at extending it. But it never offers eternal life. It offers no path to it. Only Christ has those words. Only Christ has that sacrifice. Only Christ can make the promise that you, as you are, but without sin and corruption, but even better than God, than, than God intended you to be at the beginning, as a new human, a new uh, humanity, glorified, resurrected, perfected, are able to look forward to spend spending all eternity in undiminished joy. It's hard to believe in Jesus. It is. And it's okay to ask questions about that when it's hard. Kids, it's okay to ask questions. There's a lot of complicated things in the Bible. There's a lot of hard stuff. There's a lot of things in this book that I don't understand. So it's okay to ask questions about that. It's difficult. And it's difficult to be a Christian in the world. There's no doubt sometimes our belief is strained. We're under pressure to abandon Christ. And we don't want to be pragmatic and say, well, I'm just going with whatever works. But we do have to believe whatever is true. And what is true is that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. And we have to go with the one who has the words of eternal life. And Jesus Christ is the only one who offers those words. Where else will you go? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent Jesus Christ to be our true food and our true drink, to sustain our life. Father, we have questions. We have confused minds often, we doubt. We feel pressure, both from outside and from inside, <clears throat> to walk away. Pray that you would continue to work faith in our hearts, that you would strengthen our minds and our spirits, that we might believe all the more, even in the face of all of these outside pressures, even in the face of our own sin that causes us to doubt your love for us. And I pray that you would... Help us to always be bold, to speak the words of eternal life that Christ has given us to speak. Christ, name we pray. Amen.